Hey, how are you doing today, sir? This is pretty cool. I gotta say, I'm, I'm doing good. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's not a bad day being on a not press a conference with the... Uh... It's very strange when you have an idea in your head and it's kind of your little baby and then you write the script and a few more people know about it and then the trailers come out and people are kind of aware but suddenly the movie's coming out and you're at a press conference and there's posters everywhere and you're seeing billboards. It's, it is a pretty thrilling, surreal experience. I, I could not be more excited. And, and here's the good thing. The movie's actually really good. <laughs> that, that does help. That, that, that's what makes this all really kind of nice. Um, I was saying this to other people that uh, uh, it's definitely geared towards kids slash families. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, that's definitely the movie you guys made. And, yes. there's, and there's no apologies. That's Unapologetically that's... a family, kid-oriented movie for sure. But for kids of all ages, 8 to 80. Right, of course. I like that. It's, well, it's absolutely four know, quadrants. It's all men, women. It's a... <laughs> men, women, children. But, you know, I think that's true because for me, I, I still love those movies I saw as a kid. I still go back and rewatch, you know, the Harry Potter films. I still go back and rewatch Star Wars and movies that meant something to me as a, as a child. So this movie, for me, I would never pretend to put it in the same canon as some of those. But it feels like a movie that, although aimed at kids and aimed at families translates for people of all ages and it feels very in keeping with the theme of Barry's book which for me I always felt like if you're a kid the Barry book means something very different than if you're a grown up as a kid I read it and go oh it's wish fulfillment and adventure and going off this extraordinary place but as a grown up and he was touched on this a lot it is sort of this clarion call to not forget the child inside you never lose that sense of wonder and the tumult of what everyday grown up life kind of looks like so I think this movie hopefully at its best functions in a similar way for for adults and grown ups and slightly older kids. Uh, what do you think it is about the Peter Pan story that has resonated for generations, that, that people, just everyone, responds to it? I think it's a sense that anything's possible, right? Peter really does live in a world of pure imagination. Neverland is a place where anything can happen, where a boy can fly, where people don't age, where pirates can wage constant war against the natives and vice versa, and fairies populate this island. So I, I think that there's some, this is the original kind of dreamland and people of all ages for seemingly all time, or at least the last hundred or so years, have engaged with and responded to and loved these characters. And I think that for adults, it really is a chance to revisit their childhood. And that's, I think, what Barry was going for, uh, in some sense, with his book, was a story about kids who come from our world and learn about what it means to be a child and learn about a land where they never have to grow up. And that's always going to be a concept that is interesting and exciting to people. For me, I... I grew up with sort of the world-building films of a hero who's sent into an extraordinary adventure. Joseph Campbell mythology, you know, clearly has shaped the way I look at the, the storytelling universe. And so the opportunity to take that approach to Neverland was really, really exciting for me. Talk a little bit about the genesis of the script and how this all got started. Yeah, I mean, this was this has been kind of a 20-year process for me. I'm 29. When I was nine years old, I got stuck on a Peter Pan amusement park ride with my dad. Have you been on the, 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 the ride where you're on the pirate ship, it's at Disney World, and you're flying over miniature London? Um, I was it's on really cool. at Disneyland. It's the same ride. Oh, okay. It's the same ride. So I got stuck in that pirate ship with my dad over London for about half an hour. And we're just sitting up there, and my dad probably wanted to kill himself, but I was having the time of my life. And Peter and Wendy were kind of just out of arm's reach over there, and I had a million questions for him about why Peter Pan was Peter Pan, and how he learned to fly, and why he and Hook hate each other so much. And... From that experience really came this movie where for years and years I'd think about that and revisit those ideas and think, well, what is pixie dust? Where does it come from? Why are the fairies there? What if there was a time when the fairies were almost extinct? And how did that Peter Hook relationship evolve? They hate each other so much. Didn't that somehow have to start from a place of love to get intense, as intense as it ended up being? So I really always wanted to tell the story. I always wanted to create a Peter Pan origin story, prequel. And I didn't have the opportunity to do it until really at the end of 2012. I just finished my experience on Ice Age 4, which I'd co-written. And I wanted to go pitch the script. And I didn't write it because I was afraid if I wrote it and it didn't get made, it would just be too painful. I was too emotionally attached to it. And so I went and pitched it to every studio. And it's very exciting when you go in and pitch to studios. You think, oh my God, this is it. It's all going to happen. This is going to be brilliant. And everyone passed. No, I did not meet with Warner Brothers at the time. I didn't have any relationships there. But everyone at that moment had their own Peter Pan projects because there's this kind of instinct in the industry now to mine IP and take characters people know and find a way to, uh, to reinvent them. So I was bummed. I was totally bummed. I was really, really kind of crestfallen that this project wasn't going to come together. And if you were on a date with me 
anytime between the end of 2012 and the spring of 2013, I probably pitched you this movie. I couldn't <laughs> stop. You could have shaken me awake in the middle of the night, and I would have given you the identical pitch I gave to studios verbatim. And I ended up getting a general meeting with an executive at Warner Brothers named Sarah Schechter, who said to me, what would you do if you could write anything? And I said, anything? You said, anything. I said, well, I have this Peter Pan thing, but everyone's passed on it, and you're not going to want to do it, and it's kind of a waste to even tell you about it. She said, no, no, tell me. And I told her, and she said, oh, we'll buy that. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Okay, this is really <laughs> happening. And Greg Berlanti then came on as a producer. But every stage of this journey has been an exercise in sort of uh, blowing my expectations out of the water. When I wrote it, I thought, as so many scripts uh, do, I thought it would just be a script. I thought I'd write it, and you know, some, you know, who knows where it would end up going. And then suddenly, Joe Wright was on board. And it was like, okay, we got my dream director. This is pretty exciting. But now we've got to cast it. I don't know if anyone's going to sign on to this thing. And then about a month after that, Hugh Jackman's playing Blackbeard. And you just keep pinching yourself throughout the process. And suddenly we're here talking about a real movie that I couldn't be prouder of. I mean, it's very, very exciting and very gratifying to have seen it come this whole distance to where it is now. And I couldn't be prouder of the film. From what you pitched in that room, from your ideas that you had back then, to what people are seeing on screen right now, or will see on screen... Yeah. Were there any big changes, or was it pretty much this is what you originally pitched? I mean, filmmaking is super collaborative, and there's definitely been a lot of changes as the script went on, but essentially, the pitch is the movie you're going to see. I mean, I really I had a very clear sense of the story I wanted to tell. I had a very specific image in my mind of what that world looked like, what sort of the dynamics of each group of characters were. Um, so I, as, as close from pitch to screen as I think I'm ever going to see in my career. And I owe, I owe a lot of that to Joe who really a lot of directors come in and like to change things up for the sake of changing things up. And I think Joe genuinely, something about the script connected with him. He has, you know, he has two sons, but at the time he had his, his son Zubin, only Zubin. And he was looking for a movie that Zubin could see and fall in love with and sort of mean to him what, what Star Wars and Harry Potter and Jurassic Park had meant to me. And Joe signed on and I think was very sort of eager to understand why I was so passionate about this story. And throughout the process, he was very inclusive, and I was able to be on set for a lot of the shoot, almost, almost the entire shoot. It was a five and a half month, quite long shoot in London. Uh, but I, I was very lucky. You, you know probably as well as anyone that screenwriters are the first ones to, in the process, sort of <laughs> get the boot. And you, you live I've in- I've never heard that from anyone. You live, <laughs> you live in constant fear as a screenwriter that this is the day you're suddenly no longer gonna be employed on the movie. And Joe just had a wonderful way from the very beginning saying, Jason, this is our movie, we're gonna go and make an incredible thing together, and I want you to be a part of this journey. And so it's very much a Joe Wright film, but he was beyond inclusive of me in it, and I'm incredibly appreciative. So you meet with Warner Brothers, yes. you make the movie, um, you obviously now develop a relationship with Warner Brothers, yes. and then you start writing some well, other... You, you never know, that's the thing about these relationships with studios. They like you for like two seconds. Right. So when they like you, you really have to take advantage of it, because that could go away very quickly. You don't, you don't want to live under the illusion that suddenly you're like the, the Warner Brothers guy. Um, no, but I, 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 uh, I know some of the Warner Brothers executives. I've met a lot of people over there, yeah. and it's very much a family community over there. It really is. It's very much like once they have your hooks in you, you're there, especially they're, if they like your work. War, Warner's has been very kind to me, I have to say. Yeah, uh, so I have to ask you, how did you get offered or how did you start working on some small superhero movie? I haven't heard about this. What is it? Um, <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, this is what I would say. You, uh, when you work for DC, it's sort of like uh, working with the CIA. You have a, a vow of silence. And uh, I think as we speak, Zack Snyder is going to come in here and try to put a muzzle on me. Um, well, I'm not asking for story specifics. I think that uh, yeah, I, the trouble with DC is that you really can't say much. And so I'm excited about everything that's going on in that universe. But, and I've certainly read the same reports you've read about what my involvement in that might be. But I, I can only speak to it as a fan. And I can tell you, I am someone who from a very young age was a huge fan of the DC Comics. A huge fan of sort of that key troika in the Justice League, Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, uh, as well as all the other characters. So I am very, very happy that that DC Cinematic Universe is finally being fleshed out. And I don't think it's any secret, people who've seen the Batman v Superman trailer or the Suicide Squad trailer can see that this is a very different cinematic universe than the one that Marvel has constructed over at Disney or than the one that Simon Kinberg and company have constructed uh, with X-Men over Fox. It's a really specific, grand, slightly darker, slightly grittier place. And as a fan of those comic books and as a fan of those movies, I'm very, very excited to see where it goes next. I have said repeatedly on record since the day I saw it that I fucking love Man of Steel. 
Like, As do I. I love that movie so much. If it comes on HBO, I'm lost for however long it's still on. Like I love and the soundtrack. This, I, mean, I love everything about I that, that Hans Zimmer soundtrack I, I write to you all the time I love that soundtrack and it's just a great movie my, my two soundtracks that I listen to again and again and I don't mean to put myself in this is the Hans Zimmer Man of Steel yeah. and uh, Daft Punk uh, Tron Legacy oh I love the Tron Legacy soundtrack is also excellent yeah th- those are my two I can listen to those endlessly um, so I, I think music is uh, music is such a huge part of why these movies are uh, particularly Man of Steel and Tron uh, we were, John Powell on this movie, I think, really kind of saved the day and gave this movie a soul. I mean, I, I, there's something so special about getting the right composer to score your film. And I grew up obviously listening to those John Williams scores. And I was listening to, I think it was John Williams in an interview, an old interview, talking recently about how Steven Spielberg kind of didn't know how to NDT. He knew the story points and he'd shot it, but he'd edited it together and it didn't quite work. And he said to John, just write the score. Score the finale and I will edit it to fit what you decide to do emotionally in that score. And you rewatch the end of that movie and it really does blow you in. You go, oh my God, it's a musical. I mean, he is cutting to fit into the narrative that John Williams is writing in music. And I think that, you know, we didn't go to that extent with uh, with Joe and John Powell in this one, but John has written a really beautiful, elegant, swashbuckling score that for me calls to mind a lot of those classic John Williams pieces. Uh, and I, well, the first time I heard it, I sort of jumped out of my seat. Because when you see the movie without a score, it's a very different experience. You kind of know where the emotional beats are supposed to happen, and you know what you want to feel and feel and you know, sort of see in your head. But that first time of seeing the movie with John's score was something I will never forget. Well, that, that's, I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that, as you just said, the score, it, it really is... It, the, the thing about movies is it is such a collaboration where you never really know what it's going to be until you see that finished product. You know, and, and then you're like, oh, this is the movie. Very much so. I, I had seen a lot of cuts of this film and I've been at a lot of our test screenings but I had not seen the very finished cut with John score all in and all the CGI finished until we saw the premiere this past Sunday in London and so I, I loved the movie and I knew it was gonna be good but I kind of didn't know exactly what I was gonna get to see when I walked into that theater and I'm there with my parents and my girlfriend and we're all kind of excited and also trepidatious going okay we know what the, we've read the script we know what the cuts are what is this thing going to be? And then seeing it with that crowd of people, a 1,300-seater Odeon Empire in Leicester Square, I was blown away. I was really, really thrilled by the movie that Joe and that the whole team made. I'm very proud of it. And I also think that what sort of separates us from a lot of films in a similar genre, sort of these revisionist fairy tales that are the trend, is that this movie was generated by a writer just trying to tell his passion story and by a director who was just trying to make a movie for his kid. It has a very sort of authentic, heartfelt feel, and I think that that comes through in the finished product. Uh, before I run out of time with you, yes. what's about to happen, uh, we need to talk about La La Land. Yeah, oh my God, I had the best time on that. Yeah. I have a really small part in that movie. You Doesn't matter, miss let's me. still talk about but it. But I, I miss the acting so much, and I've been so lucky with the opportunities I've gotten on the writing side that it's been it's been hard to step away and find time to, uh, to act. But this was a situation where they called me up and said, hey, this is a very small role. You're going to be playing a douchebag screenwriter. <laughs> who, tries, who tries to steal Emma Stone away from Ryan Gosling, and would you be interested? And I thought, oh yeah, of course, absolutely. I could douchebag screenwriter. I could absolutely play that. And I'm going to lose the girl to Gosling? Done. <laughs> Done. If, if anyone can lose a girl to Gosling, it's me. I think uh, but by it was, that, that could be any person. <laughs> like, yeah. Not just douchebag screenwriter. Yeah, that's probably it. That's probably, he is a very, very good looking dude. Between him and Hugh, it's really, it's been quite... <laughs> Quite a stretch of leading men I've been working with, but he, he was, I mean, Gosling and Emma have such a great dynamic, they've worked together so many times. Seeing him in this, the movie was, was pretty exciting. And the movie is special, I mean, it's, it's a love letter to Los Angeles. It's a very, very sweet, romantic, classic feeling film, and Damien is just virtuosic. I mean, yeah, he, he's awesome, but I have to ask you, yeah. he, uh, Whiplash was, I mean, I don't know, I haven't met one person who didn't think Whiplash was uh, unbelievable. Amazing. Did you feel, or did you feel like Damien or anyone on set, like, the pressure of following up such a hit? Do you know what I mean? It's so loved. Had I been Damien, the pressure would have been so intense that I would have collapsed and had a complete nervous breakdown on set in front of everyone. But Damien being uh, measurably less neurotic than I am (laughs) and uh, seemingly has his shit together far more, uh, could not have been more calm or composed. It was such a fun, laid back set. And I think that's a tribute to, and he reminds me of Joe in this way. Joe and Damien are two directors who really know what they want. And when they, when you have a director who has such a clear vision, the stress tends to go away. There are practical things that crop up and stress is inherent in making a movie. 
But when you have an image in your head of what this movie is going to be, you just go execute it. And watching Damien and watching Joe, I certainly learned a lot about what really, really great directors operate like. And uh, it was surprisingly a rela very relaxed environment. No sense of pressure of living up to expectations. And you know, having been a part of that film and seen a lot of it come together, I think that La La Land will meet, uh, if not exceed, the expectations uh, following up Whiplash, which I agree was a really special film. And for me, it was the best movie of that year. I mean, I love it. Um, I gotta go, but uh, what are you working on now? What, what am I working on now? I mean, you're not writing what Wonder Woman. So, like, uh, what do you... So I have read, I've read those articles, mm -hmm. uh, and if that is true, that would be really cool, and I, I hope those are true. Right, exactly. Um, but, so, what, what am I... The, the, honestly, the next thing that I'm really excited about is a script called Break My Heart a Thousand Times, which is based on a YA book by Daniel Waters. Really cool book. It takes place in a world where ghosts have become a part of our everyday lives, and Haley Steinfeld is going to be playing the lead in that, and we start shooting that in Winnipeg, uh, beginning of February. Winnipeg. That's great. Yeah, when, nothing like Winnipeg in February. Jesus. Something tells me my agents won't be visiting me on that set. I was going to say no, no set visits. That is, That's great. And we Scott, you know Scott Spear? Uh, yes. Scott Spear's going to be directing. He's doing Midnight Sun right now with Bella Thorne and Patrick Schwarzenegger, and this will be his follow-up to that. So I'm, I'm excited about that because it's a very different kind of film for me. It's much darker. It's a smaller movie, kind of a departure from uh, Ice Age Continental Draft for sure. So I'm I'm excited to uh, to scratch that slightly darker edge and see uh, see what people think. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you chatting with me.